and Joseph Olson will be reading to us today. Ruth 2, 4 through 7. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, Lord be with, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Thank you, Joseph. David? Uh, you can stand if you'd like. Let's sing page 286 in the hymnal. Or it should be up on the screen. There you go. Once in royal David's city stood a lowly cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ, her little child. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all, and his shelter was a stable, and his cradle was a stall. With the poor and mean and low, lived on earth our Savior. Jesus is our childhood's pattern. Day by day, like us, he grew. He was little, weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles like us he knew, and he feeleth for our sadness, and he shareth in our gladness. And our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love. For that child, so dear and gentle, is our Lord in heaven above. And he leads his children on to the place where he is gone. Page 269, how great our joy. The joy is not just passing, it's... It goes deep. It's not like happiness. It's joy. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. While by a sheep we watched at night, glad tidings brought an angel bright. How great our joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 praise we the Lord in heaven on high, praise we the Lord in heaven on high. There shall be born, so he did say, in Bethlehem a child today, how great our joy. Great our joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. There shall the child live in a soul. This child who shall redeem us all. How great our joy. Great our joy. Joy, joy, joy. Joy, joy, joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. 
Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. This gift of God will cherish well, that ever joy our hearts shall fill. How great our joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. One more, page 292. Thou didst leave thy throne. This is a sort of an old one, I guess, but I like the, the sentiment in the end. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. And whether you're not saved and you need to be saved and invite Jesus into your heart, or you already have him in there, there's always some dark corner that you're, I'm always hiding somewhere. He points that one out here and that one out there, and you've got to uncover it for him. So there's room, there's more room for Jesus. Let, him, let more of him into you today. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal decree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility. O oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. The foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O thou Son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. When the heavens shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, Yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, David. Before we get to the sermon, I didn't read my announcements carefully, and Roslyn, I'm not letting you out of the... She has a birthday today, so we got to sing to Ros. Anybody else? Birthday, anniversary you want to recognize? All right, let's sing happy birthday to Roslyn. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. All right, we're back in the book of Ruth now. So if you have your Bibles with you today, if you can open them up to Ruth chapter 2, just going to do kind of a quick um, overview of where we've been so far, remembering that Ruth is a widow from Moab 
who had married one of Naomi's sons, who di died along with her son and Naomi's husband in Moab. They go back to um, Bethlehem. They're looking for grace. They're looking for favor. They, they know that Moab has nothing left to offer them, and they're ready to go, or Naomi's ready to go back home to her, her homeland, and she knows, she makes that long, hard journey that just maybe, just maybe God will meet her there. And Ruth is the daughter-in-law who says, I'm going with you no matter where you go. And so today, we, we see them here, and Naomi and Ruth are looking for something to eat. They're looking for food. And so uh, Ruth goes out, and she just needs enough of the gleanings of the field in, in order to make a meal for herself and for Naomi. She didn't know it at the time. As she goes out into the field, she doesn't understand or, or, or know this at the time, that God was directing her steps, that God was taking her from a pagan land, bringing her to the promised land, and directing her steps to bring her face to face with this man named Boaz, who was a wealthy relative of Naomi. God leads her to this place where she's going to be noticed by this wealthy relative, which is very interesting because now Boaz becomes what we call the kinsman redeemer. And that kinsman redeemer, if we go back and talk about that again, is that male relative who had the privilege and the responsibility to act on the behalf of a relative who was in trouble, who was in danger, or who was in need. What a difference a day makes in the life of Ruth and Naomi here. The day before, they don't, understand, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't know how they're going to be taken care of. Remember, Naomi, when she went with her husband Elimelech to Moab, left full and came back empty. And so here she is with her daughter-in-law, and what a difference a day makes. They make this long journey from Moab to Bethlehem, unsure of what they're going to find, and so Naomi, go, Naomi says, hey, I'm, I'm a, I have an idea here. You're going to go out into the fields and you're going to glean. We're, we're, we're going to take some of the, 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 the leftovers from the harvest because that's what God's provision for the widows and the orphans and those who couldn't provide. And it wasn't God's accident that all of this happened. It wasn't some just happen chance. This is God's divine providence working behind the scenes, even though Ruth and Naomi are completely and totally unaware of what's going on. God is orchestrating all of this right now. And the book of Ruth is an incredible love story. We read this, and it's not only just an incredible love story of, of, of Ruth and Boaz here, but it, again, God is orchestrating everything that needs to happen. We can go all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to the creation story, and God had this in plan. This was already mapped out. God knew exactly, and we're going to see in the next few weeks, how the lineage of our Lord and Savior was mapped out through all of these situations, through these people that nobody else would ever point at and say, yeah, that's where the Messiah is going to come from. And so today, we see in, 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 in Ruth chapter 2, a beautiful illustration of what the New Testament church should look like, how we should act. We've, we've already discussed that Boaz, in, in the story of Ruth, is a typology, a picture of Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. And so the first thing I want to look at is just this field. There's this field that, that, that is going to be harvested. And in verses 4 and 5, it says, Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servants, Who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? So Boaz took a little time. He goes out and he checks on his field. Now we have several farmers in, in, here, here today, watching online, Boaz had a particular interest in this field. He was vested in this field. And one of the things that I've learned, just, you know, I, I, I said this before, I, I grew up on military bases. We didn't grow anything. I, I, 
I, when I met my wife, I didn't understand, you know, the difference between field corn and sweet corn or, you know, just anything that was grown in, in, in the fields. I, I, I had, had no idea. But one thing I have learned is that you just can't throw it out there, walk away from it, and then come back later and expect to harvest it. It's not a throw and grow type thing. And so here, Boaz has this vested interest because it's his field. He's put the time, he's put the money into this field. He's put the seed into this field, and he wants to make sure he's getting the harvest that he's wanting from that particular field. And so I want to stop here just for a second, and I want you to think about this. So Boaz was this kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. And just as Boaz steps out of his role of just the, 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 this wealthy relative, and he comes down into the field to see what his investment is bringing him, God does the same thing with you and me. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, to be with us. We are never alone. He came to us during this Christmas season as Emmanuel, God with us. The writer of Hebrews says this in 13.5. He says, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is always there with us. See, we don't have to worry about being left behind. We don't have to worry about trying to make our own way through, through this life without any direction or any help or attendance from God himself. Psalms 37 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. God is always there. He's always there. He has a vested interest in you. He has a vested interest in the church, in the body. And he's there. He, he, he's ready to do the things that he needs to do in your heart and in your life. He's always near to us. He, he's always that ever-present help to his children. And we have to remember that. And just as Boaz had this interest, he cared for the field, yes, but more importantly, he cared for the servants of the field. In verse 4, it says, And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. That's an interesting statement in itself right there. And, and when we stop and think about that, why would he say this? Why would he look at his servants, the people he's paying to do a job, and just simply say, the Lord be with you? It's because he cared. He genuinely cared for their well-being. He understood that if his servants were taken care of, both physically, both um, financially and spiritually, he would reap a better harvest. He desired a blessing. It wasn't that he wanted to hoard it all for himself. He desires a blessing for his servants, the blessing of God. He, he wants to make sure the blessing that he receives is extended to those who are working for him. See, he wasn't this slave driver. He wasn't a taskmaster who came out and said, you know, you have to get this much done for me, and, and, and if you don't, I'm going to cut your wages, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That wasn't who he was. He was a man of compassion for those who served him. And see, God did the same thing for us. Jesus loved us so much that he gave up the splendor of heaven he gave it all up so that he can do what? To come and walk in a sinful world and die an incredibly painful death, suffering on the cross to bear our sins and the judgment of those sins, to die in our place so we can be reconciled to God. See, he had compassion on us. He desires, God desires that we would all come to him in repentance to enjoy this abundance that he gives us through eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. See, he wasn't just interested in us having a life here on earth. 
He wants us to have an abundant life, an eternal life with Him forever and ever. And so Boaz goes to this field. And just as Christ comes and he sees the stranger in the field and he sees his children, his servants in the field, Boaz immediately, because he has a vested interest, he knows, who, he, he knows his employees, he knows every inch of that field. I, I, I'm sure some of my farmers in here can tell you where every dip, where every valley is, where the good corners of the field are, where the, where the bad parts of the field are. They can tell you everything about it. And they can also tell you if something is out of place in that field. And this is what happens with Boaz. He immediately recognizes that something is out of place. And he says to his servants, who's in charge here? Whose young woman is this? I recognize somebody who isn't normally here. He paid careful attention to the field and all, all of the people who were there. He knew exactly what was going on. And he wanted to make sure that his harvest was brought in. Okay, that's his number one thing. He wanted to make sure that harvest is brought in. But he's also concerned with those who are less fortunate. For those who are in the field and those who are in the field because they are in, in of need. See, God made a provision in his law. Okay, Old Testament law. He made a provision that the less fortunate could come in behind the harvesters and glean the corners of the field. This was a normal process. I'm sure Boaz could have just you know, said, hey, yeah, somebody's over there, whatever. It's just one of those less fortunate people gleaning from the field. And never have noticed Ruth. But then we have to go back. We have to go back and remember that God told Eve that her offspring would bruise the serpent, would crush the serpent. And then the plan was set in motion. Boaz could have easily just looked over and said, oh, just some more peasants over there. Just some more people who don't know how to take care of themselves. But he doesn't. He notices her. He takes interest in her. And praise God. Praise God that he did. Because of this, we see the lineage of Christ being mapped out. Praise God that he was aware of you. Praise God that he was aware of me when I was completely and totally unaware of him. Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrated his own love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He noticed you. He noticed me. He was willing to pay the price for your sins and my sins. He noticed me when I was in the field off in the corner gleaning for the leftovers, trying to pick, pick up enough of my life to make it through, not knowing what true joy that we sang about today is, not understanding what true freedom is, not understanding what happiness is when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're in the field, we're digging around for, for, for the scraps, for the leftovers, but God notices us. He notices that we were separated from Him. He notices that we are desperate in our sin to find some hope, to find some reassurance in this life. Because He knows the field. He knows what's supposed to be in the field. He knows, He notices those who are in the field and he's ready to reach out and to bless those in the field. So if we, if we continue on here, we notice the servants of the field as well. Verse 4, again, Boaz comes to them and, and, and speaks to them. And we see here that these servants are a picture of God's children. Because remember, Boaz is that typology, that picture of who Jesus Christ is. Boaz comes to the field and the servants are already there. The workers are already in the field doing their job. They didn't wait. They weren't sitting around going, man, I wonder if Boaz is ever going to show up today. We probably ought to get busy on that harvest. They were already doing their job. They weren't sitting around waiting for Boaz to call them in and say, hey, guys, I got a harvest here. I need you to bring in. Make sure you leave a little bit in the corners for those people who are less fortunate here. They were already there. 
They were anticipating the owner of the field to come and check on his field. And that's how we are to live as God's children, as his servants. We need to be faithful. We need to have a desire in our hearts and our lives to serve the king, to serve the master. And that's what the servants are doing here. We need to have that desire. We need to have that drive in our hearts and our lives that we are laboring in the field, not for our own gain, not for our glory, not for a a, a church or anybody else's glory, but for God's glory, for the owner. And we need to be doing this until he comes back for his church. Psalms 27 verse 4 says this, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. That needs to be the call of our heart. We need to be actively out in the field. We need to be actively serving God, just as the servants were for Boaz here today. See, the servants loved Boaz. They loved him. How can we tell that they loved him? Look how they answered him. Boaz immediately looks at him and says, The Lord be with you. And they replied back to him, The Lord bless you. They wanted to see their boss. They they wanted to see God bless him because they knew that when God blessed Boaz, Boaz loved them and Boaz was going to bless them as well. So in this Christmas season, it's so easy to sit back and say, well, 2020 was a crazy year. A lot of things happened that I didn't expect to happen. And, you know, I I wasn't as blessed as I thought I should have been. And it's real easy to get negative with all the things going on around us. I was telling somebody um, uh, Christmas Eve before we came to church, I thought, I just wanted to check the weather before we left, and I truly, honestly don't watch national news. And that's all that was on. And I went through three stations in a matter of about two and a half minutes, and I was ready to just call it quits right after that. Because the world's coming to an end. We're all going to die. And there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, it was so depressing. All three channels that I went to. And you know what? You're right. The news is right. We are all going to die. But that's God's decision. It's not mine. It's God's decision. When God chooses to take me home, he'll take me home. And there's nothing that I can do about it. There's nothing that a doctor can do about it. There's nothing that a vaccine can do about it. God will take me home when he's ready to take me home. And so many times we forget that God loves us. We forget, we see all this stuff going on around us that he is the master of the field and he honestly, earnestly wants to bless us and we cry out to him, well, I didn't get what I wanted. You know, I I was expecting more instead of being like the servants who are working and saying to Boaz, the Lord bless you. They wanted God to bless him. Have you thought about the blessings that you enjoy today, even in spite of all the things that are going on around us because of a pandemic and everything else, the the blessings that we enjoy because of God's provision, because of God's hand in your life. I mean, we are all here today and we can take in a breath of oxygen and let it back out and continue that process because God has blessed each and every one of us. God has had his hand upon each and every one of us. We need to live a life like these servants where we love, we appreciate God for who he is and what he's done for us. Not, when, when I say that, I want to be careful and let you understand. I'm not talking about financial gain. I'm not talking about material possessions. I'm talking about what God's done for us in eternity. Because... Last time I checked, there's a good country song out there. I've never seen a hearse with a trailer hitch. Okay, you don't see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It doesn't happen because all of this stuff is just that it's stuff and it's staying here. But when Christ died for you and for me, 
he showed us the ultimate love. And the word tells us when we believe in him and make him Lord and master of our lives, we will have eternity with him. That's what I'm talking about when we sit back and we look at the things that he's done in our hearts and our lives. It's, it, it's not about a job or anything else. It's about eternity. It's about eternal salvation with him. See, he goes to the field and he sees his servants and the servants had a job and they understood that they were responsible for the harvest. It was their job, it was their task to bring in the grain that had grown and matured in this field that they had tended and they had cultivated over the growing season. They didn't, they didn't just throw it out there and hope that it would grow. They didn't throw out corn seed out there and hope pumpkins would grow or throw out pumpkins and hope beans would grow. They knew exactly what they were doing. But here is the kicker of it. Very few of us are willing to be like the servants. Very few of us are willing to enter the field seeking to harvest the crop. We're all called. We're all called to be the laborers in the field. I tell my kids this every once in a while. I said, you know, we're all called to, to do whatever it is. And e e everybody gets, you know, focused in on something that they really like to do. And, you know, you, you can add whatever title to you want, want to it. But, e you know, everybody wants to be a cowboy until it c comes time to do cowboy stuff, right? You know, everybody wants to be the leader until it comes time to do the stuff that requires you to be the leader. Nobody wants to do the work. They just want to go and reap the harvest. See, we're required to be in the field. We're required to be working. We reap the harvest. We reap the seed that has been planted and produces fruit. But in order to get to that fruit, we can't just throw it and grow it. We have to go out there and we have to cultivate. We have to tend. We have to water. We have to weed. And Carla and I, you know, according to our kids, begrudgingly, and <laughs> got into pumpkin business. And one thing I've learned is that it's a lot of work. And you'll see, well, people talk about, oh, yeah, you just throw the seed out there and it grows, right? Oh, no. There is no such thing as a Roundup Ready pumpkin. It, 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 it's, you know, everybody in here is old enough to understand it's like walking the beans. And you pull those weeds. You got to work for the harvest. And that's what we're called to do. We are called to be those laborers. Matthew 9, 37 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Everybody wants to be a cowboy until it's time to do cowboy stuff. And we need to pray that we have the workers in the field, that we have the servants in the field who are willing to not only bring in the harvest, but are willing to tend, to water, to weed, to cultivate, to do those things. And then we see the stranger in the field. We see Ruth in the field. And Ruth is that representation of the unsaved, of those who need God in their hearts and their lives. So Boaz sees Ruth and he instantly has sympathy and compassion for her, just as God has for us. And some people say, well, how can that be? Because, you know, Boaz was a devout Jew, and here is Ruth, a Moab woman who was a pagan. But remember, Boaz is that picture of who Christ is, and he sees us in our sin. Boaz sees this pagan woman and has compassion for her. She was a widow of a Jew. She was the daughter-in-law of a relative of Boaz, a Jew. Ruth and Naomi came home, came from a pagan land, came from Moab with nothing of value. They had nothing left to contribute to society. They were just simply trying to get by. And most owners of the field would have just glanced at her, let her glean the field, and walked on. Wouldn't have paid her any mind. But that's not what Boaz did. Boaz did. He, 
looks to his servants and he says, who is this woman? Who is it? There's something about this woman. So Boaz finds her in the field, scraping by, getting just enough to make a meal for her and her mother-in-law. So my question for you today, where did God find you in the field? Where did he find you? Colossians 1 gives us that, starting at verse 21. And it says, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. God saw us in the field. And he sent his son, Jesus. He sent his son, Jesus, to redeem us through his death. Because of his death, the word tells us that we are presented holy, blameless, and above reproach in God's sight because of his son. We were a stranger. We were a foreigner. We were pagans. Yet, He had compassion on us. Though we were sinful, though we were defiled, He had compassion. He had mercy. We had absolutely nothing to offer God but our sin and our desperation to come out of that sin. And while Christ hung on the cross, He saw you. I know we don't see it in Scripture. I know He doesn't call out name by name. But I'm a firm believer when Christ died on that cross and the angels were flying all around Him ready to come down and remove Him from the cross at at a snap of a finger, at a blink of an eye. He looked up to heaven and He saw His Father and He said, No, I'll do it for Matt. I'll do it for Dan. I'll do it for Paul. I'll do it for Christy. He saw you here today because, again, it's not an accident you're here at Newburgh Chester or you're watching online today. It's God's divine providence. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just, for the just and the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. That's what He does for us. He sees you in the field. He sees you scratching just for a meager existence. And He says, I've got something bigger for you today. This, all of this around us, is going to pass away. It's going to rust away. It's going to rot. But I have eternity for you. I have eternal life for you. We, we always ask ourselves, what happens when I take my last breath? And I'll never forget Dr. Ralph Johnson at the University of Northern Iowa, the one professor I didn't want to take. And we took humanities class. And the entire humanities class, we had two books. One was called Positive Mental Attitude. Good stuff, right? Always have a positive attitude. And the rest of it was the Holy Bible. That was my humanities class, my Western humanities class. And we looked at the life of Job. And one of the things he said in class, and I still remember this, and it took years for it to actually sink in. And I can't remember who who the um, theologian was who said this. He said, but you can say God is not real and be wrong and have hell to pay. You can say God is not real and be right and there's nothing. He says, but if I say God is real, and I'm right, I have eternity with him. If I'm wrong, nothing. He said, I'm going to bet on that God is real and going to heaven instead of saying God is not real and going to hell. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that we are all strangers. We were foreigners to God, yet He gives us this opportunity. He doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to die 
without knowing his son as their Lord and Savior. And see, here's Ruth and Naomi. They come to Bethlehem alone. They're broken. They had little hope for any type of survival. They had to rely on the compassion of strangers. But yet Ruth was determined to seek out survival. She wanted to sustain her physical life, but yet God had a bigger picture here. He he wanted to sustain her spiritual life. And he sends this man, Boaz. She doesn't understand. She doesn't know what's going on. But Boaz steps into her life. And, and, And I'm very aware about God's sovereignty and the faith that is necessary for the individual to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm very well aware that we must be drawn by the Spirit. And I don't want people to get hung up on words here because you'll hear people say, when I made the decision, and then you'll, you'll get into arguments with some fundamentalists and say, you never made the decision. God brought you to that place, and God placed it in you. You did not make the decision. You are not capable of making that decision. And I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here, because I know that we must be drawn by the Spirit. Jesus tells us that in John 6. He says, no one can come to the Father unless me, I'm sorry, no one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him. The Spirit has to draw us to him. But I know, without a doubt, I rejoice in that moment, in that night in 1994, when I realized my need for God, when I realized the condition of my heart was sinful and wicked, and I thank God every day that He allowed me that sense of urgency of the condition of my heart. I still had a choice that night, and I had choices every time before that when someone would present the gospel to me. And I turned around and walked away. I made a choice. But that night in 94, when the gospel was presented to me, the Holy Spirit was drawing me to Him. And I thank Him for that opportunity. I thank Him for giving me the ability to make that decision that night. Because God understood the urgency, He knew my condition, He knew where I was in the field. See, Ruth here, as we read on, it says, And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Ruth knew that she was in a good place. And she was in no hurry to get out of there. She's like, Hey, Boaz, I mean, I understand you're the owner here. Just let me have my corner of the field here. Let me glean. This is wonderful. This is what I need right now in my heart and my life. She wasn't looking at the field going, you know, this guy's a terrible farmer. There's hardly anything left here. You know, if I were in charge, this is what I would do, and this is how I would treat my workers. This is how I would have planted the field. I would have used this variety instead of that variety. I wouldn't have bought that. I would have gone over here to this seed dealer, and she didn't do all that. She didn't complain about what was going on in the field. She was in no hurry to leave. And we need that commitment. As believers, we need that commitment that she had here to not leave the field, to stay in the field as long as it, it, as it takes, as long as necessary. We need to be satisfied. We need to be satisfied with what God has for us. But so many of us, we're not satisfied with what's in the field. We, 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 we complain. We get disappointed. But Ruth understood something here. Ruth understood that the field of Boaz was exactly what she needed. And she wasn't out looking for that better field. And see, so many Christians today are out there looking for that better field. They're looking in all the wrong places. They forget that everything we need for life and godliness is right here in the Word of God. And they're looking for that best worship service. They're looking for that next new pastor who just says the right things, dresses the right way. And they're looking for that next new program at church instead of getting into the field and getting into the Word of God. 
They come to church, but they're just never satisfied. They always find something in the church. They find something in the field that they can pick and complain about. See, they need to stay in the field a little bit longer. They need to glean in the field of grace until their lives are completely fulfilled with Christ, finding favor in Him because He alone, He alone, Jesus Christ is the one that provides what we need. And so many of us forget that. We forget and we become complacent. God provided Ruth for just what she needed at this time. And there's so many times in our lives that we are completely unaware of what God has provided for us and his hand of mercy and protection that is on our hearts and our lives. I mean, if we look at this, the servants were there protecting Ruth, providing Ruth with what she needed. And I'm glad that there's people out there that do that in the church. I am so thankful for those men and women who saw me in my youth and my ignorance when it came to the things of God. And they reached out to me and they prayed over me and they provided for me and they led me and they taught me, they discipled me. That's who the servants are right here. She was guarded by the servants. They didn't judge her. They didn't go, oh man, you're one of them pagan women from Moab. What are you even doing here? You don't belong in this building. You don't belong in this field. You need to go somewhere else. No, they open up their hearts. They open up their lives. And I rejoice that there's people out there who loved me in my sinful condition, who loved me in my ignorance, and they sought after me, and they encouraged me. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do as servants. We're called to reach out to the Ruths. We're called to disciple them and to minister to them. And just as she was noticed by Boaz and she had no idea who he was, he had his eye on her. God has his eye on you. He's watching you. That's the God that we serve. Long before we ever knew him, or even aware of who he is or who he was, he had his eye on us. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Speaking to Jeremiah, He says, and before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's our God. We might not be aware of it, but God is doing something in your heart and in your life right now. Because he set us apart and he had a plan for us. And I'm so thankful that we can look into God's word and we can see this field of grace where Ruth and Naomi are finding the favor of Boaz. I'm so thankful that we find God's favor when we step into the field and we follow him and we do what we've been called to do. And I am challenged and I'm reminded of the responsibilities that he gives me as his child to be his servant. And I pray today that you are as well. I rejoice in the fact that God is a God of compassion and a God of provision. And even though I I lived the first 21 years of my life in sinful ignorance, He had compassion on me. And no matter how old you are, how young you are, He has compassion. He has a plan for you. And I'm thankful that He has taken the time to notice me and to hold me up. I'm thankful that he notices each and every person here today and he, he, he sends his son to redeem us, to restore us. See, some of you today are in that field among the leftovers. You're searching around in the pickings, in the gleanings, looking for just enough to get by. Christ desires today that you become one of his own, that you become the servant, that you become the reaper of the field. If you've never trusted in Christ today, you've never trusted him for that saving grace, he never turns anyone away who's willing to make that decision. He doesn't turn you away when you're willing to bow your heart and life before him and hand it all over to him. 
Because in that field, we find the favor and we find the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be that payment for our sins. And Lord, I pray today if there's anybody watching online or here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today, today would be the acceptable day of salvation, that they would cry out to you that, yes, Lord, I am a sinner and I need you in my heart and my life. I recognize that you've been there with me every step of the way, but yet I've turned my back on you. I am ready, Lord, to be your servant, to be your follower. Be Lord and master of my life today. Father, I pray today that that is the cry of many a heart. And all of the angels in heaven will be rejoicing today because souls were added to your kingdom. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As David comes up this morning, our final hymn is Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Hymn number 295. I like this song. I like this song because it has the whole story. It's not just Jesus in a manger. It's Jesus in a manger and on the cross and risen again. And that's the whole story. It's Jesus all the way through. He was born and he died for us. Sing page 295. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard.
Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for that story of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you, from the very beginning of creation, had the plan of Jesus Christ. And you set in forth motion everything that needed to happen for your son to come to this earth, to come as God with us, to come as Emmanuel, to be that final perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice for each and every one of our sins. Let us never forget that beautiful story of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with each and every one of us here today as we go our separate ways, as we go home to eat, wherever it might be, that your story of Jesus Christ would be written on our hearts and our lives so that other people will notice that they will see us just as Boaz saw Ruth in the field and they will know that something is special, something is different about us and we can share that story of Jesus Christ with the world around us. Father, I pray that your hand of blessing and protection would be with each and every one of us and you would bring us back here again safely next week so we can praise and worship you next week as a blessed church family and we would have those stories, those beautiful stories of how we shared the gospel the gospel story of Jesus Christ with the world around us. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.